everyone. Welcome to Take Charge of Your Health and to our Bible study. The health message is not a separate message to the gospel. And as we will find out today, once again, they cannot be severed. Today we're discussing character, the high destiny of our work. What does character have to do with our salvation? If its role is so crucial, then we need to find out just how to achieve that perfect character. And we have Dr. John Clark discussing this important topic with us. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Clark. Thank you so much for coming back to discuss um, this issue with us today. Well, it's good to be with you, Sosie. And it's a very, very interesting topic, at least in my estimation. It is definitely. And how I know it's like you said, it's so interesting, but important as well is that the one time we were organizing to give this talk about lifestyle and salvation and the link of lifestyle to salvation, we had pushed back even before we did the talk. So um, there is something in the topic that seems to stir people and what what do you think that is well you know uh one time i sat down and talked with a, a professor from andrews and started presenting this idea and he started objecting just just vehemently and i'm like well what's the matter <laughs> and i think what it really has to do with is people would like to have a sign sealed and stamped salvation ticket and then sit back in their easy chair and uh, get on with some other interest in life and uh, that isn't just what it's all about uh, it, it's good to have a sign seal and stamp to you know title to heaven but if you're not prepared for it if you're not uh, fit for it it's going to be a very unhappy experience to actually arrive there and discover that uh, that, that that it's like it's like learning to drive and then and then you decide to get in the car and you've never been in a car before and you try going around a roundabout and you're like, whoa, I should have practiced this ahead of time. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's part of it is because it, it, it suggests that we have to overcome sin. And that really mm. worries some people. Yeah. And I guess when Paul says, I bring my body into subjection, is that just the mental things or it's the physical as well, and um, that's why I guess you will be discussing that as well. Um, so I'm I'm interested. I know that in heaven we will have new, everything will be new, but whether we will have new taste buds or um, it's, again, loving God that perhaps will um, is preparing us to have also taste buds that will accommodate for the the heavenly diet right well there you go i guess uh, the more we get our taste buds in order down here the less the culture shock when we get up there eh <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so i'm looking forward to finding out more just how character is linked to our salvation and how to have control over it and um, let's start with a word of prayer and um, get into the discussion Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity again to come together and discuss um, very important issues, especially the topic of our character and salvation. We know that that will be the only thing we'll take to heaven with us. So please help us to understand just how to take control over our characters and um, please be with our speaker as well, Dr. Clark, and be with us that we will have open hearts and minds again to accept what you have, um, what you have for us. We thank you and ask all these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
So I've titled this uh, High Destiny, the character of our work. And, you know, heaven is a beautiful place full of beautiful, happy angels. But it wasn't always that way. And, uh, and, and, and it all started when Lucifer began to be sort of frustrated with the government of God. And, and as things developed in heaven, he decided that he should be God because God wasn't doing it right. And besides, God had an awfully, uh, you know, enviable position, and he thought maybe he could fill that position. And it really messed with his character. And it ended up that uh, the angels uh, had a big fight up there, <laughs> war broke out. Satan was cast out, and the history of God's universe was really tarnished. And preventative strategies had to be put in place to protect the universe against uh, these, this happening again. And so we're told that affliction shall not rise a second time. But how? Is it because God now becomes very authoritarian and keeps everybody in line, whether they like it or not? And we knew what that experiment, experiment was all about. And and so now we're going to force everybody to be good, or is it even something less uh, onerous uh, that uh, God is going to make sure that uh, there's a blessing that entices everybody to do what's right? Or is it that we are so, so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, that we could never be moved, as was Satan, to violate the peace of heaven? Well, let's go back to that time. Uh, there was a time when uh, the angels uh, were all talking about the issues. Angels switched sides. And then eventually God announced to the angel hosts uh, the real issues between Jesus Christ and Satan. And Satan and his followers all were sent away, cast out of heaven, down to this earth. When they were cast out of heaven down to this earth, that left heaven with a big deficit. Friends had been separated. Angels in heaven mourned the fate of those who had been their companions in happiness and bliss. Their loss was felt in heaven. It was a, a time of great, you might say, depression. You know, somebody might be, some angel might be sitting there saying, well, where is Celestine? Uh, and somebody else, well, she, she went with Lucifer. And, and so we come to the earth and, you know, the trees. And well, so Jesus and God, you know, God the Father had to do something to get the, you know, the spirits up in heaven. He says, well, okay, we got to get on at once with carrying out the purpose of making man to inhabit the earth. Uh, but, 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 but he couldn't just put man on earth without making sure there was something in place so that there would be a test of loyalty, a, uh, you know, to make sure the universe would be okay before man would be given free run of the universe. And so he would place man upon probation to test his loyalty before he could be rendered, quote unquote, eternally secure. And so Adam wasn't lost. He wasn't saved. He was just, well, on probation. Okay, well, what was Adam's mission before the fall? If he chose to accept it, he's on probation. What's his job? What's the goal of Adam? What's he there for? What should he be doing? Uh, you know, and, and so we look at this and we find that God had him doing something. Um, he was to dress and keep the garden. God might have created the, them without the power to transgress his requirements. Why didn't he do that? Let's just make them robots. They'll do what we say. But in that case, there could have been no development of character. Their service would not have been voluntary, but forced. So really, the biggest object of these two trees and free choice and and so forth, was the development of character. Something Satan had done to his hurt by developing a bad character. 
and something we need to do so that we have a good character. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law, all on his own with the, you know, the equipment God had given him, the brain God had given him, the environment God had given him, the instruction God had given him. And so it's like, uh, you know, setting down at uh, kindergarten and bringing out the crafts and giving the, uh, giving the young people a bunch of paper and pens and saying, giving them a job and they could do it. Well, Adam could do it. But once God gave them the free choice, you know what happened? Adam and Eve exercised that choice, albeit under deception, and followed Satan's lead. They were like that third of the angels that got cast out of heaven. They listened to the devil, believed him. And uh, so now they were in big trouble. And uh, the big trouble was the problem. I mean, it was like uh, God had told him in the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. And so Jesus had to intervene. He had to come and guarantee his life for the life of these new people. He had to say, I will be their surety. I will be their substitute. I will pay the price. And what was the result of the price? Once he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, what did that do to Adam's job? Nothing. His job was still to develop a character, a very important job. When death was proclaimed as the penalty of sin, he offered to give his life for the life of the world in order that man might be put on a second to probation. And so what would a well-formed character look like? What would it do for the universe? Here's Adam. He's supposed to have this well-formed character. And so he's put on a second probation, says Signs of Times, and receive power to form a character after the divine image. So Adam's job is the same. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, he was now just able to name it and claim it and be saved. His whole job was to develop a character so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, that he would not be moved, that he would not reintroduce sin into the universe. Now, God sent them out of the garden. You see, the reason he sent them out of, a gar out of the garden is, you know, a good character cannot be developed in a vacuum. It takes polishing. It takes some grit. It takes some grinding. And so no longer were they to dwell in Eden. For in its perfection, it could not, it, it could not teach them the lessons which it was now essential for them to learn. They needed a school of, as we say, hard knocks. And so... Does God have any personal investment or stake in the outcome of your character development? Why did he want Adam to have a good character? Why did he put him on a second probation to develop a good character? Well, here's a good one. You have not a sound mind, and unless there is a great change in you, you will not be able to so perfect Christian character as to obtain eternal life. And so our eternal life is dependent upon our character. At the very onset of the Christian life, every believer should be taught its foundation principles. He should be taught that he is not merely to be saved by Christ's sacrifice, but that he is to make the life of Christ his life and the character of Christ his character that should really put it in perspective i thought we gave them their baptismal certificates patted them on the back and said you're in buddy just sit back in the pews and enjoy but no our job is to develop a character for salvation a character for eternity not just merely to be saved by a sacrifice a sacrifice was to give us a second probation so we could develop a character for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life says romans 5 10. 
And what does that mean, saved by his life? Does that mean because he had a life and he died, we're saved? We are reconciled to God by his death, and we shall be saved by his life as it is wrought out in our character. And so our salvation is dependent upon our character. Now, so I say we need to have some intentionality about this. Intentional Christianity, intentional Christian uh, character sanctification. We need to aim at a target. We need to be prepared. And at the end of the day, we need to have hit the bullseye. And so character formed by circumstances are changeable and discordant. What's that mean? If you just wait to see what happens and wait for the hard knocks to come along and not do anything to purposely develop character, you'll have a character that's changeable and discordant. A mass of contraries. Their possessors have no high aim or purpose in life. They have no ennobling influence upon the character of others. They are purposeless and powerless. That's scary. Those who are waiting to behold a magical change in their characters without determined effort on their part to overcome sin will be disappointed. It's something you need to take an active role in. It's part of victory over sin. Let no one say, I cannot overcome my defects of character, for if this is your decision, then you cannot have eternal life. This is pretty strong statements. When there is a determined purpose born in your heart to overcome, you will have a disposition to overcome and will cultivate those traits of character that are desirable and will engage in conflict with steady, persevering effort. You will exercise a ceaseless watchfulness over your defects of character and will cultivate right practices in little things. And so character is developed by being careful of little things. If you believe you cannot be perfect, can you be perfect? I had a, <laughs> I had the, a, a chance to work behind a gentleman who was a lay pastor. We would go to his church once in a while, and he certainly didn't believe in perfection by his preaching. One day it was my chance to lay bricks behind him. He had laid bricks uh, about a third of the way up a well house, and I needed to finish the job, I discovered that not only did he believe in imperfection, he practiced it. <laughs> it was hard to straighten out some of the mess of those, uh, you know, uneven bricks and, and make them look good. And so why do some people find it hard to perfect Christian character? Or even the concept hard? Or the idea? Well, see, we have to war against the flesh. Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. Well, a lot of people are going to jump off the wagon right there. It's not easy. Count me out. A noble, well-rounded character is not inherited. It does not come to us by accident. A noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. Yes, you're empowered to do it. Yes, there's merits. Yes, there's grace. But it's your effort, your individual effort, and the wisdom you gain with time. Boy, it's not like you win the lottery and get this. And uh, can you do it on your own? Can you do it without Christ? No. He will do it with, you know, will he do it 100% without you? No. Will he do it without 100% of your effort? No. He wants 100% of your effort, and then he adds the power. I kind of think about it like power steering. We have the job of turning the steering wheel, but he, he turns the wheels. And uh, God gives the talents, the powers of the mind. We form the character. It is formed by hard, stern battles with self. Conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary tendencies. We shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not one unfavorable trait to remain uncorrected. Wow. Boy. 
Yes. So we need to take this seriously, I guess is what we're saying. We need to take it very seriously. And one of the big things that will be a challenge is appetite. And here we're reading the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. When? If they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. It's like boot camp. If you can't make it on appetite, you're not going to make it on anything else. If you can make it on appetite, you can gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. And so we see the huge link between uh, health reform, diet, medical missionary work, and the gospel. The gospel is there to help you become like Jesus Christ so you can be a Christian, a Christ-like one. And so appetite will not help you get there. Giving into appetite, as Eve did in the garden, is not going to benefit you. Now, why then the health message? Well, he who cherishes the light, which God has given him upon health reform, has an important aid in the work of becoming sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality. You see, sanctification is the process of character development. But if he disregards the light and lives in violation of natural law, he must pay the penalty. His spiritual powers are benumbed. And how can he perfect holiness in the fear of God? He cannot. And so this is a big issue. What's an example of something people, you know, like a lot? And, you know, what is something that they eat a lot of and might ruin their character? How about sugar? Sugar is not good for the stomach. Why not? It causes fermentation. That's not good. And this clouds the brain and brings peevishness into the disposition. Wow. So you're eating this stuff and you end up with peevishness in your disposition. That's not good. That's going to make it hard to develop a character. You're going to develop a peevish character. Oh, Lord, help us all, huh? about the animalization of your character. I was instructed that the use of flesh meat has a tendency to animalize the nature. Oh, it's probably not a good animal either, right? And to rob men and women of the love and sympathy which they should feel for everyone. We are built up from that which we eat. And those whose diet is largely composed of animal food are brought into a condition where they allow the lower passions to assume control of the higher powers of the being. There are many kinds of wholesome food, but we do say that flesh meat is not the right food for God's people. It animalizes human beings. In a country such as this, speaking of America, where there are fruits, grains, and nuts in abundance, how can one think that he must eat the flesh of dead animals? Well, another one. These people here are working with hot peppers. Food prepared with condiments and spices inflames the stomach, corrupts the blood, and paves the way to stronger stimulants. It induces nervous debility, impatience, and lack of self-control. Tobacco and wine cup follow. Wow. The child was proverbial for her nervousness and irritability of temper. And these fire, fiery condiments were well calculated to, to produce such a condition. People eat fiery food and they get a fiery disposition and they have trouble developing character. The abuse of the stomach by the gratification of appetite are the fruitful source of most church trials. It's like you get in board meeting and you can't get anywhere. An intemperate man cannot be a patient man. The sin of intemperate eating, eating too frequently, too much, and of rich, unwholesome food destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the brain, and perverts the judgment. Preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. And this 
is a fruitful source of church trials. So I need to develop character. I need to prepare character. What is my real big challenge in developing the patience of the saints? What is the big challenge? Well, every round goes higher. You've heard of Peter's ladder. And to temperance, patience. The need of becoming temperate is made manifest as we try to make this step. It is the next step in the, uh, excuse me, it is next to an impossibility for an intemperate person to be patience, patient. No impatient man or woman will ever enter into the courts of heaven. We must not allow the natural feelings to control our judgment. Many are quickly irritated. And their words are sharp and bitter just because they were intemperate. So, let's think about the Christian home. Why does God want us in a Christian home? Christian homes, established and conducted in accordance with God's plan, are among his most effective agencies for the formation of Christian character and for the advancement of his work. And so the Christian home is there to develop Christian young people. You know how in the wilderness, God said that uh, the mixed multitude couldn't enter into the congregation of Israel for a few generations. It's because he wanted them to be sanctified, the sanctification that builds with generations. It's really the work of a lifetime, isn't it? Uh, sanctification of character is the work of a lifetime our lives are to be hewn and squared and polished until they reflect the likeness of christ romans 2 6 and 7 says who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life and so it's a patient process it's a lifetime process a continued process and well-doing so we are hewed and shaped and fitted Ellen White had something to say to a brother who needed to spend more time with his character development in the testimonies he's called brother F brother F you are naturally an impatient fretful exacting man at home and after a short acquaintance you show this out in new places you frequently talk in an impatient overbearing manner and then she asks the question that we all need to think about. What time have you set to gain the victory over your perverse will and the defects in your character? Do you have a calendar set up? You want to get your character fixed by the end of the year, perhaps? Reading on. With the advancement you now make, how old you're getting, your probation may close before you have made a determined effort essential to give you the victory over self. Amazing, huh? Psalm says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Every day that passes makes one less left us to complete our work in perfecting character. If you've gotten old and never thought about perfecting character, it's time to think about it, to See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. If you've wasted time, redeem the time. Well, what is character? It's really our thoughts, our feelings, our habits. Isn't it right? If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong, and the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. And so your character is your thoughts and feelings. Thus, actions repeated form habits, habits form character. And by the character, our destiny for time and eternity is decided. Wow. So strength of character consists in two things, power of will and power of self-control, we're told in Maranatha 2.23. And so character is thoughts, feelings and habits thoughts feelings and habits and so that's what we need to grow we need to sanctify our thoughts we need to sanctify our feelings we need to sanctify our habits 
do how do we sanctify our thoughts really i will study in truth right and there is nothing more calculated to energize the mind and strengthen the intellect than the study of the word of god no other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts to give vigor to the faculties as the broad ennobling truths of the bible if god's word were studied as it should be men would have a breadth of mind a nobility of character and a stability of purpose that is rarely seen in these times and so bible study elevates the thoughts and and nobles the character so there you go how do i fix my thoughts bible study study of the word and uh, also the law god has given us his law to man as a measure of character by this law you can see and become excuse me by this law you may see and overcome every defect in your character you may serve you may sever yourself from every idol and link yourself to the throne of god by the golden chain of grace and truth let us as christ followers search our hearts as with a lighted candle to see what manner of spirit we are of how do we do that for our present and eternal good let us criticize our actions to see how they stand in the light of the law of god for this law is our standard let every soul search his own heart let us earnestly examine ourselves by the light of god's word seeking to discover every defect of character that we may wash our robes and make them white in the blood of the lamb so the law is our friend to help us see the defects in our character that we might perfect character prayer is also important prayer is heaven's uh, prayer is heaven's ordained means of success in the conflict with sin and the development of christian character and so we're talking about thoughts here let's talk about feelings thoughts feelings and habits make up the character we said and so how do we sanctify our feelings how many feelings do we have all kinds of feelings and so behold the man of calvary that's the way you get your feelings fixed up by beholding we become changed into the same image carnal thoughts those aren't good carnal feelings that's not good will be no will be no longer entertained you will no longer be frivolous cheap in talk and unholy in life then you will reach through the grace of christ the high standard of purity and elevation of character there you go by beholding our character our thoughts our feelings are 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 really addressed that's this is the antidote and so we behold christ right in knowing christ through the grace that he has shed forth abundantly we become changed and the character is sanctified through belief in the truth when this is accomplished we reflect as in a mirror the glory of the lord that is the character of the one who thus beholds christ is so like his that one looking at his sees christ's own character shining out as from a mirror do you look like christ you know we start out saying some people don't like this message and you know the people that uh taught the ford message didn't like this ford uh made fun of people who wanted to be little christ and uh, was not possible but here the possibility is not only possible it is essential we're learning here so how do we sanctify the habits we've talked about thoughts studying the bible we've talked about feelings studying the cross now we need to talk about habits because these make up the character thoughts feelings and habits how do we sanctify the habits make it a habit to imitate christ the perfect pattern and so it's like an artist working on a piece of canvas it is not by looking away from him <laughs> that we imitate the life of christ but by talking of him by dwelling upon his perfections by seeking to refine the tastes and elevate the character by trying through faith and love and the earnest persevering effort to approach the perfect pattern 
By having a knowledge of Christ, his words, his habits, and his lessons of instruction, we borrow the virtues of the character we have so closely studied and become imbued with the spirit we have so much admired. Jesus becomes to us a, a, the chiefest among 10,000, the one altogether lovely. And so you seek to imitate the pattern, make his life activities your habits. True education also has to do with character development. True character does not ignore the value of scientific knowledge and literary requirements. But above information, it values power. Above power, goodness. Above intellectual acquirements, character. So the ultimate goal in true education is a character, a character that will not reintroduce sin into the universe. How do you know if your character is really developed? How do you, what would it look like if it was fully uh, accomplished? You had a Christian character. Well, the completeness of Christian, Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within, when the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. Incredible. Wow. Can you just imagine that? Your every impulse is just to help and bless others, not yourself. There it is. There it is. He permits us to come in contact with suffering and calamity in order to call us out of our selfishness. He seeks to develop in us the attributes of his character, which are compassion, tenderness, love. By accepting this work of ministry, we place ourselves in his school, school of higher education, right? To be fitted for the courts of God. Remember, Daniel was fitted for the courts of Babylon. We want to be fitted for the courts of God. By rejecting it, we reject his instruction and choose eternal separation from his presence. Not a good thing. Now, I want to talk about the ten virgins. Remember, they had an oil crisis. They had an oil crisis crisis some had oil some did not in the parable the foolish virgins are represented as begging for oil and failing to receive it at their request this is symbolic of those who have not prepared themselves by developing a character to stand in the time of crisis so what does it take to stand in a time of crisis a character what makes the difference between the the foolish virgins who never make it into heaven and the wise character it is as if they should go to the neighbors and say give me your character or i shall be lost those that were wise could not impart their oil to the flickering lamps of the foolish virgins character is not transferable it is not to be brought bought or sold it is to be acquired you can't magically make a character. That's why Adam had to develop character in the Garden of Eden be even before sin. You can't just create it out of nothing. It has to be developed through uh, the school of Christ. You see, God wants to make sure there's not another Lucifer in heaven. We are all to be tested here in this life to prove whether, if admitted to heaven, we shall repeat the same course that Satan pursued there. But if the character which we develop during our probation is according to the divine pattern, it qualifies us to receive the welcome. Well done, now good and faithful servant. So that is what makes a difference, whether you get the well done, whether you get God's stamp of approval, is your character. God doesn't want any more satanic characters no more bells above up in heaven. And so the seal of the living God will place upon, be placed upon those only who bear a likeness to Christ in character. Really? So the sealing isn't whether you keep the Sabbath or not? Sabbath is part of developing character. So Christianity is not just a get out of jail free card. It's not a name it, claim it religion. It's a religion that leads to the result of the fruit of a pure holy character like jesus christ 
sealed in their foreheads. That's what the seal will be, this character seal. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but of settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. So they won't be like Eve and decide, oh, you know, I could try that fruit and just see what happens. No, their character is firm. Their habits are holy. Their thoughts are pure. They're, they're, they're always uh, on the right track because they've decided to do that and they've practiced doing that. They are prepared for heaven. We do not want another Lucifer in heaven. Reading here, were justice extinct? And were it possible for divine mercy to open the gates to those, to the whole race, irrespective of character, there would be a worse condition of disaffection and rebellion in heaven than before Satan was expelled. The peace, happiness, and harmony of heaven would be broken. And so God is testing characters. See who will make heaven a happy place. Could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven? Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no. Years of probation were, were granted them that they might form characters for heaven. But they have never trained the mind to love purity. They have never learned the language of heaven, which is praise and honor and glory. And now it is too late. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Wow. We're coming a full circle here, aren't we? We've come at character from just about every angle. And what about our end times? As we near the second coming, we are to give the Elijah message. What's the Elijah message all about? Well, John declared to the Jews that their standing before God was to be decided by their character and life. Profession was worthless. If their life and character were not in harmony with God's law, they were not his people. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the Elijah before Jesus came the first time. We are the Elijah before he comes the second time. And so character had everything to do with his message. Remember, he said, you guys are a brood of vipers. They said, what shall we do? And he gave them answers. And so we're looking at character development as the end time message. The time of trouble is the crucible that is to bring out Christ-like characters. Bring out. Why didn't it say develop them? That's not the time to develop character. That's the time just to show what the character looks like. It is designed to lead the people of God to renounce Satan and his temptations. The more of, it, more of that you do now, the less of it you'll have to do then. Let none be discouraged in view of the severe trials to be met in the time of Jacob's trouble, which is yet before them. Really? Don't worry about Jacob's trouble? Why not? They are to work earnestly, anxiously, not for that time, but for today. Doing what? In these precious closing hours of probation, we have a deep and living experience to gain. We shall thus form characters that will ensure our deliverance in the time of trouble. What will ensure our deliverance? Characters. That's right. Characters will. So pre preparation for the time of trouble. Shouldn't I be like stocking, piling food? Shouldn't I be like, uh, you know, buying guns? Or uh, maybe I should be, uh, you know, finding a place out in the country so far away I can't even find myself. Uh, no. Character is the answer to the time of trouble, to the preparation. Character is the only thing you can bring to heaven. A character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. How important then is the development of character in this life. But Jesus paid it all. Isn't belief in him all I need? Well, I need to be like him as well. 
we either honor God or we don't. The honor of God, the honor of Jesus Christ is involved in the perfection of your character. Your character is his glory revealed in you. And so God is waiting for us to glorify him in character to show what we what his character is like to the world. He's his honor is involved in this. Either you honor him or dishonor him. Uh, you bring honor, honor to him or disgrace. That's why it says uh, in the third commandment, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you dishonor him by your character, you're breaking that commandment. And so aren't I going to end up getting twinkled at some point? Like, you know, doesn't Corinthians say in the twinkling of an eye? Some people believe in the twinkling doctrine. I can be wicked now. God will twinkle me into a saint. Well, if he twinkled you into a saint without you having to develop character, he'd take, be taking somebody else to heaven in your body. It wouldn't be you because your character isn't good. And so, you know, <laughs> no magic here. Uh, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come. Not until then. Then and only then will he come to claim them as his own. He's not coming back until he has some people who in character reflect him. He's not just coming back to get a bunch of people that named it and claimed it, thought they won the lottery, and just lived like the devil. He wants people who have a likeness to him. And how about 1844 and beyond? What does that have to do with character development? If the message had been of as short duration as many of us supposed, the great disappointment in 1844, there would have been no time for them to develop character. Why have we been here so long? Why didn't he just come back in 1863 or whatever? Because there's a bunch of people that still need to develop character. Amazing. Let me reread that. If the message had been of as short duration as many of us supposed, there would have been no time for them to develop character. Many moved from feeling, not from principle and faith. And this psalm, fearful message, stirred them. It wrought upon their feelings and excited their fears, but did not accomplish the work which God designed that it should, the development of character. And so God needed 1844 to get them aroused, but he needed more time so that they could develop character. Wow, historical fact, eh? So in, he in heaven, who is the greatest? It's very interesting who's the greatest. You know, Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, uh, you want to be the, the, the master, then you need to start out as a servant. In the kingdom of heaven, position is not gained through favoritism. It's not that God gets all excited about some person and decides to make them the first because he likes them. No. What is it based on then? It is not earned. Oh, you mean I can't make enough money to buy it? No. You can't work hard enough to impress the boss? No. Nor is it received through an arbitrary bestowal. Every third person gets to be king. No, it is the result of character. Why is Jesus the king of kings and lord of lords? Because he has the greatest character. The crown and the throne are tokens uh, of a condition attained, tokens of self-conquest through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are in a position up there, it's because your character shows that you belong in that position. Not because somebody you were friends with somebody and they snuck you in the back door. And so we will be kings and priests to him that overcometh. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne? The overcomers who upon the earth were partakers of the divine nature, he makes kings and priests unto God. <coughs> Excuse me. So he has uh, to have faith in you, right? He has to have faith in you. How do you know he has faith in you? He has to believe in you that you can be brought to heaven and not reintroduce sin. How do we know he has to have faith in you? Re Revelation twenty-two, twelve, And behold, I come quickly. 
And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work. What's that? Shall be. What do you mean shall be? Yeah. Your work in heaven. Your work in eternity. You mean you're basing the reward on what you expect from us in the future? What he knows he can expect from you in the future because of the character he knows he's helped you build. In summary, Adam failed to develop a sinless character in Eden. Jesus secured us a second probation so we can develop a sinless character like his that can be sealed for heaven. Characters developed in a world of hard knocks by beholding Christ in his word and especially in his law and conforming our lives to his. True education and sanctification is developing a character for eternity where we will be priests and kings. God is interested in your character development and is underwriting the whole process. Wow. That's um, really, as you mentioned as well, Dr. Clark, is multidimensional, isn't it? It's not just do this and that and you will be saved. And, um, you know, we do need to work hard. And the Bible in many instances indicates that we do need to work. And as we said before as well, Paul says, I bring my body into subjection, so under subjection. Um so that is that is important what we do here in this in this life and it is an exciting message as well um i personally get excited when i find out what it is that i can do that i haven't thought of before like oh this is why my par my character is still not where it needs to be not that we can ever arrive i don't think um but I think it's 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 better to be warned than to lose our salvation, isn't it? It's it's a message that irritates people, but I think we should be excited to find out what it is that we need to do for our character development. Amen. Yes, uh, the, the the stakes are high, and uh, the, the big thing is God doesn't want to have sin reintroduced into the universe. Yeah, exactly. And you said why that is. Um, why it is that, I guess, part of the reason why it won't be reintroduced, you said as well, he doesn't want any more Lucifers in heaven. So um, that explains how how it will be. So Yes, and you see how characters developed by habit. If Eve, every time she went by that tree, just said no, I'm not going to touch that tree. After a while, the thought process would have become habit. And at some point, it would have been not even a considered option anymore. Mm, that's right. And we think it would have been easy for Eve. We think she felt at that one point, you know, if only that was me, I wouldn't have done that. But we do it today <laughs> when we indulge um, in the things that we should not, whether it be food or whether it be the incorrect thoughts and um, the thought patterns, right? Oh, yes. Yes, that's for sure. And so that's why we have the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and of judgment of righteousness. So it's a, yeah, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. And um, one thing I want to mention as well, and for our viewers as well, and this is um, this may be difficult to hear, but I have I have spoken to an ex Satanist as well, and um, in one of his interviews he mentioned that um, Satan requires his followers to follow a particular diet of plant based foods, so. I'm just thinking he knows something that we don't clearly and we don't follow what his followers follow, you know. So he wants his followers to have that clarity of mind and to reach that experience that they are looking for. Yet um, here we are and saying diet has no bearing on our salvation. So it's a sobering thought. Yeah, very sobering. Yeah, I've read those accounts. Uh, I read a lady who was talking about this on the internet that uh, she became a witch and wanted to talk with the spirits. And they said, well, if you want to do that, you have to give up meat. She said, no way. 
<laughs> and she married wow. a guy that was <laughs> married a guy that was uh, was a vegetarian and uh, and eventually went vegetarian, went back to the spirits and said, uh, well, I'm vegetarian now. And they said, now you need to go vegan. So if you can really want to have your mind <laughs> able to be worked by us. And um, yeah. again, she said, no way. <laughs> but then her husband went vegan and then she went vegan. And she says, wow, now I can really communicate with the spirit. Wow. Makes you wonder. Yeah. Um, like I said, Satan knows something that um, we, I guess, a lot of the times refuse to accept. Um, so the other question, obviously, we'll talk more about diet because that seems to be the point of contention in a lot of cases. Um, but is um, my, my question is, are our choices dependent on our age? Because I've heard this before as well, that, oh, well, he's older, so then it's going to be difficult, more difficult for him to make better choices or, well, this is just his character and he's not, he's not going to change now. So let's say my husband is 41 and I'm 36. Is he... Um, less I, I guess responsible or less, less flexible in his character than i am well uh, that's a good question you know god can do anything but uh, there's certainly the challenges of getting stuck in your ways and there are a few quotes to that effect uh, in the spirit of prophecy especially about training kids while they're young you know the, mm. the, the proverbs proverbs or ecclesiastes says to train up a child uh, when he's young and when he's old he won't depart from it um yeah, there's certain advantages of that but i've seen older people make uh, massive changes in lifestyle and and reap big benefits from it and uh though it may be less likely for older people who are setting their ways to change it doesn't mean the change is impossible jesus has uh, by his uh, death uh, really bought for us uh, the second probation a second uh, uh free will to, to make these choices and so he will empower the choices if we are willing willing to put in the you know the effort and and the thought yeah exactly and um i was actually reading a statement by ellen white and um she says something like um if we are not raised the way we should be so if the parents don't raise the kids the way they should if they were to be saved they will see just how close they came to not being saved so it is important hey the early education the early years of childhood so it it makes you wonder and i can see for myself that things that i didn't used to do when i was younger it's so much harder to change the the thought patterns and and the habits like you were saying as well but it is possible yes praise the lord we can't make ourselves younger well at least it doesn't seem like it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly when it comes to the brain um we were doing presentations with jennifer skews as well and we are talking about how um the older we get we're supposed to get smarter not the other way around so yeah brain is a muscle isn't it yeah there you go the more you use it the stronger it gets yeah supposed to be so my other question dr clark is again about meat so i've heard this before well jesus ate meat and he ate fish and um and he had lamb so and the bible clearly allows there there are there is a category of clean meat and then unclean meat as well so um why would the bible allow something that um is not good for us we are saying it's a good question because there's definitely a problem with eating meat for character development and uh, we put in that quote about animalizing the nature um, Jesus definitely bore our sins. He took our infirmities. He lived among us. If he'd come down here and had a lunchbox with an eternal supply of, you know, manna, everybody would have said he had an unfair advantage. He gets to eat manna all the time out of his lunchbox. Um, <laughs> he ate what we ate. And, uh, but uh, it also is true that he lived under the courtyard experience. In other words, in the sanctuary, uh he came to be the lamb in the courtyard 
and uh, in the courtyard you slew lambs and priests ate some of the of the meat, right? But uh, as we moved with his ascension to, into heaven, into the holy place, then what you have is bread and wine on the on the table of showbread. You have oil in the lamps, and uh, you don't have a, a lot of meat and so forth. And then you move into the most holy place after 1844, and then you have almonds and manna. <laughs> and uh, mm. so... It's it's an experience that God wants us to come more and more into line with His His message, and uh, and so we can't say what uh, you know what Noah ate is good enough for me or what David ate is good enough for me. Daniel was the big example that uh, here's a man that uh, that there's no recorded sins that he did. Oh, we know all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, but there wasn't a lot to write about for Daniel, and he was on this very good diet and his diet made him one of the uh you know most important writers of the bible yes isn't there a problem when we try to see what jesus ate and what um, noah ate as opposed to what character they had and how faithful they were yes to god or abraham it's hard to know what their character exactly was like um but uh you know with the, with the uh, people who ate meat in the wilderness. Ellen White says, uh, and then we have a whole talk on does uh, meat eating destroy your spiritual experience. But uh, when they were in the wilderness, we're told that God didn't want to give them meat because it would cause insubordination. It would make them mm. rebellious. The other thing is this, Jesus ate fish, but he didn't eat fish out of our polluted streams. <laughs> yeah. He ate fish in its pristine a condition before you know glyphosate was everywhere and uh, before man was so well you know man was pretty wicked but uh, the disease in uh, animals parallels the, the wickedness in men and so today we see all the rampant wickedness uh, and it's reflected in the health of the animals and so if you eat mm -hmm. the unhealthy animals then you just prepare yourself better to engage in the wickedness of men yeah, we have that talk on um, our YouTube channel as well. Um, dishes that ruin spiritual experience, um, something yeah, along those lines. We do have your talk on um, our YouTube channel as well. And we had more question there. So, yeah, if anyone is interested, they can check it out. And um, it is so true, though, about fish and you were you were talking about how contaminated it is, and I agree with that, that these days we not only eat fish but a toxic cocktail of all the heavy metals and stuff. But um, I just remember I was in Armenia. We went to a supermarket, and they have this live fish in a tank, in just a see-through glass tank where you can see, you can pick your fish and um, everything. And there have been reports of people buying fish and if they are not watching, they get the sick fish. But I was looking at this tank where all the fish were swimming and they were coupled that were just being sort of pushed around um, with the water and with the other fish, they were dead. So um that that quite scared me and um i just made a decision i was like no i don't want to even fish if if that's the last thing i have to give up in terms of animal products yeah um it's it's scary it's not what it used to be you know catching fish from flowing waters rivers as jesus did and, and also jesus um I guess wouldn't spend that much time, would he, to go and make sure that uh, his diet was vegetarian and all of that. He hung around with fishermen, right? Yeah, that's for sure. Those were his uh, buddies, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It would be different if they were farmers and yet he chose to eat fish, which is um, what we do. And that's the problem with the abundance of fruits, grains and vegetables. We still choose to eat the animal products yeah yeah that's right um okay and you explained really well that that was something that i was interested in where jesus um went to the holy place and then to the most holy place after 1844 and that's why also the symbolism is there as well that 
we should also not engage in um, in the meat. And also remembering that the lifespan got shorter, didn't it, after eating meat? We we didn't advance after that, did we? Oh, yeah. You look before the flood and the ages of men recorded were in the 900s. And then you get down to David and you're at 70 years. And they say he was a good old man. <laughs> <laughs> good old man. Yeah, exactly. And um, as you mentioned as well, Dr. Clark, it's not about meat alone. It's the sugar and the stimulants. Um, I mean, eating late, not sleeping enough. We can't find every reference in the Bible about not sleeping enough or um, having too much sugar. And a lot of the problems didn't exist back then. They didn't even have the artificial light to stay up at night. So um, we won't find every single thing in the Bible to follow. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't say in the Bible, don't stay on your cell phone past 9 p.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, and we were talking about works as well. You talked about works and how it's not name and claim it, name it and claim it message, which is, which is true. Otherwise, um, you know, again, in Hebrews 12, verse 4, we read, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And that's what one time my mom reminded me that, you know, not to be discouraged because we need to resist unto blood. That's that's how much we need to fight for it. Yeah, it's serious business. And Satan tries to tell us it's not serious. Uh, take it easy. You know, yeah, God's merciful. He'll let anybody into heaven. Satan loves, we're told that to, Satan loves to hear messages about the cross uh, the atonement, the love of Jesus, the love of God, but he doesn't want to hear a message about the judgment, the law, the doctrines. He, he wants you to avoid those. Mm, that's true. And um, along the lines of what you're saying as well, Dr. Clark, it just, I'm, I'm always reminded quite often these days, I'm reminded of second Peter one verses five to seven, where, um, it's talked about the steps to sanctification and it's just amazing what you know the the order of things that we need to follow the order of steps that we need to follow if we only had knowledge but not temperance or not wisdom or virtue then we would maybe bash people over the head with the knowledge and um, if we didn't have temperance then you know the last step is godliness and kindness brotherly love and you know we're told as well the biggest of all is love and no wonder sometimes we struggle having love because we don't follow all the other steps of sanctification right yes no isn't that true that's for sure and and yeah i mentioned that there that without uh, temperance you couldn't have patience and patience is what the saints have in the last days you know here's the patience of the saints here they that keep the commandments of god and have the faith of jesus yeah you also had a quote day that said uh, that said people who have who haven't um uh who haven't conquered on the point of appetite cannot be um patient people what was the what was the quote from yeah what was the exact Okay, so uh, maybe this is it. Councils and Diets and Foods, page 59. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. Hmm. So that's what you were saying. It's a boot camp. If you don't have that, you probably um, won't go further. And it is true. You you look around and you can see, even um, from your own life, you can see if you were one to eat meat before and now you don't eat meat, you can, you can see how it's affected you and um, how it affects, I mean, let's say not the meat, but the sugar, you can see very quickly what it does to the kids when they eat it versus when 
they have a date or banana or something that doesn't raise the blood sugar levels so rapidly, right? Yes, yes, that's for sure. I was at one person's house and they'd invited me over as they did quite often for Sabbath lunch. This time they hadn't really prepared. They said, well, we've got some vegetarian food for you, but do you mind if we finish the turkey that we have left over from Thanksgiving? I said, oh, suit yourself. And they were usually easy to get along with, but they both started eating this turkey. And before the meal was over, they were in this big fight and, and getting at each other. And I thought, wow, never seen them fight like this before. Yeah. And it was during the meal while they're still eating uh, turkey. I'm like, wow, this makes a big difference in people. True. And it's supposed to make you happy because of the tryptophan in the turkey. But... <laughs> I guess there are other substances that, um, yeah, make you more susceptible to fighting. And there's just a, yeah, really good example of that. Um, so um, what I wanted to ask you as well, Dr. Clark, you mentioned about the Sabbath, that it's not just about the Sabbath. And we know that the test in the last days is going to be about the Sabbath versus um, the counterfeit day of worship, right? So what do you think the turning point will be? Because we know Ellen White has said as well that um, if we don't conquer on the point of appetite, we will go from walking with God's people to walk with them no more. And um, that's that, again, is something that doesn't sit well with, um, with people and we can understand why. But what would be then... Um, the tipping point where we will go from knowing the truth, knowing Sabbath is the right day to worship, to, you know, caving in. One of the things we know is that on the Sabbath, we're supposed to have a special diet, a diet that is somewhat abstainious, a diet that allows mm. our mind to be clear. And be, so that when we go to church, we can better comprehend the messages. We're not supposed to overeat after the service and lose everything we gained during during the time, uh, the Sabbath is a time of sanctification. And so we said that uh, the diet in one of these uh, quotes I read was a wonderful aid in the sanctification process. And so diet would make the Sabbath sanctification that much better. And, mm. and so what does the Sabbath really help us to remember? Well, remembers, it remembers the un... Uh, well, the time in Eden before sin entered, it's a time of creation. And uh, that would be a time when Adam and Eve didn't eat animals. They ate good uh, fresh fruits and so forth off of the trees. And so Sabbath reminds us of a time when there is no sin, both in the past and in the future. And in the future in heaven, we won't be running around catching the nice lambs. And <laughs> not even the lions will be eating the lambs. So why would we? <laughs> Exactly. And um, it just makes you think about the combined lunches, that we need to be more careful with how do we mix the food and how much we eat, because a lot of the times we need to sleep after having after the combined lunches at the church. So <laughs> something to think about. Yeah, we're like, uh, so in our country, we have an animal called a bear. And when it comes to winter, they'll eat a lot of extra food and then they'll go hibernate all winter. So we're a little yeah. bit like bears on Sabbath. We overeat and then we go hibernate for the rest of the day. Mm. And to lose the, the precious time. And Ellen White talks about it as well, right? That we should not waste the precious, the precious hours of Sabbath sleeping. So. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, and... Um, as a last point, Dr. Clark, you mentioned about God not playing favorites, as we know. And we read of a few examples in the Bible. Enoch, for example, he walked with God or Moses was translated after his death. He was resurrected and translated, right? So yeah. um, we can't assume, can we, that they didn't sin. They did sin, didn't they? Certainly all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of them had life in and of themselves. So that's why all Adam, all men die. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a few things that we know of that uh, Moses did. In fact, that's why he became 
the first person to represent those who would go through the grave and then be resurrected and go mm -hmm. to heaven. Mm -hmm. Enoch is there's not really listed sins that he did. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, his walk with God was, was uh, well, we're told that he was taken to heaven to help the antediluvians realize that God's promise of eternal life was real. And so he was the first mm -hmm. one to get to leave the earth without seeing death. Mm, yeah so i guess it's just an assumption isn't it he probably had sins because like you said all have sinned um but yeah it, they're not listed in the bible so it's just um based on assumptions um but again like you said um there are no favorites there is no just um random selection that every third person goes to heaven so it is it is good news and you also mentioned in in revelation 22 verse 12 that um, we will be rewarded as our works shall be i um i haven't really i hadn't thought about that before um listening to you that it makes sense that god knows what our works shall be just um yeah it's good it's good news again amen yeah he's uh and uh, he gives us a good reputation to live up to yeah and exactly he, yeah he covers he covers us for our mistakes uh, he says all kinds of good things about us um yeah i uh, recently did a talk on god are you blind and all the people he says are good in the bible and we look at their record and we say they aren't good but he sees them as good because they've made the switch from satan's kingdom to his mm, exactly it is not by our merits that we are saved and it is a good thing yeah so yeah. um yeah we want to thank you very much dr clark again this was really informative encouraging and um sobering of course because we need the message we uh, need the message that wakes us up um, there's not enough um, talk about these things so it is good we want to thank you very much for that and um, can we ask you to close with a word of prayer please yes uh, dear father in heaven we're thankful that uh, our salvation is based on you you first last and best in everything but uh, we need to understand your way of salvation we can't just uh, sit back and do nothing we need to depend on your word we need to depend on your plan and we need to become your children more like you so that people recognize yeah that is a child of god not just that we've signed up and claim it but that our character shows that we are like christ people can say those people have been with christ by the way they act lord we pray that our characters will grow that we'll be able to take the the uh polishing and uh, the work you do on us the hewing to make us right we pray we won't uh, get weary of the process and that in the end your character will shine forth and we thank you in jesus name amen amen thank you again dr clark may god bless you and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you next time all right god bless Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you for your support. Remember, if you have any questions for us or for our guest speakers, email us at takechargeofyourhealth101 at gmail.com. We have never had so little time in which to do so much. So please share the message and bless others as well. And check out the description box for more information about our ministry and Dr. Clark's ministry as well. Visit his website and take advantage of all the free resources and uh, all the good information that he has as well. Thank you very much. May God bless you until we meet. Mm -hmm.